Hello and welcome to South County Spotlight on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm your host, Chris Collins. Once again, we're back in studio with another candidate for Deerfield Board of Selectmen. Before we get to Trevor McDaniel and talk to him about who he is and why he wants to be Selectman, a uh, bit of an appeal. I've spent the last several days trying to get a hold, as we're taping this, of Lenny Gripko and Kippy Camosa, also candidates for the Board of Selectmen seats that are available uh, to get them to come in to do interviews and hopefully to get everybody together for a debate. Haven't had much luck in, co in contacting either man. If you see them, let them know that I'm looking for them and I want them to come in and talk about why they want to be part of Deerfield's top policy board. Uh, toward that end, we're going to talk to another guy who wants to be part of the Deerfield Select Board. He is a relative newcomer to Deerfield politics. He is on the Deerfield School Committee. His name is Trevor McDaniel. So Trevor, welcome. Thank you. To the hot seat, as it were. <laughs> of South County Spotlight. Before we get going on some of the specifics and some of the issues, tell us who is Trevor McDaniel and why do you want to be a selectman? Um, so uh, my name is Trevor McDaniel. I live in town. I've lived here for uh, 12 years. Um, I grew up in Sunderland and then uh, moved to Greenfield for a bit and then moved back to uh, Deerfield when I, my wife and I uh, bought a house here in town and we have a 10-year-old uh, boy, Caleb, in the schools here. And uh, about a year ago, I ran, um, did a write-in campaign for the school committee uh, for Deerfield Elementary. And um, I was going to PTA meetings and then showing up at the school committee meetings and felt, um, I realized it was an open seat. So I felt it was um, better sit at the table than in the audience. So, uh, so I sat at the table and uh, I've been on the uh, board for a year. And in that position, I've also been... Um, a part of the Collaborative for Educational Services, which is a, which is a group of school committees um, all around Franklin and Hampshire County, and uh, we oversee that board. And, and, um, and so I wanted to get involved with Select Board because I also I realized there was a seat open. A year left, and I felt it was a good time to um, see if the town would have me, if I could do the job, and, um, and so I pulled papers to, to run. What did you learn in the last year on the Deerfield Elementary School Committee that sort of prepped you for this, you think? Uh, I think meeting with uh, constituents and s hearing their needs, and um, it feels good to be a part, of, um, a part of the conversation and being a part of a solution. Um, I thought it would be great to do it on a grander scale. So um, I think just, just trying to listen to people, trying to find solutions, um, taking the vision forward for our education of our kids. Um, so, yeah. No more important thing that a community does in educating children. Mm. We'll talk more about Absolutely. schools and the school budget in a little while, but I want to get started off on a major issue. Uh, I've been getting uh, emails from viewers asking me to ask each of the candidates I interview what their position is on the proposed natural gas pipeline, which if it gets built, could very, very seriously impact the town of Deerfield. Yeah. Where do you stand on this project? Are you opposed? Are you in favor? What? Uh, completely opposed. And um, I'm, I'm glad the town's doing everything it can and the, and the uh, county, state's really doing everything it can to stop the pipeline. Um, I don't feel it's um, needed as much as they say. Um, I think there, there probably is a need for a, a bridge gas like natural gas, but I think we should focus more on solar, wind, um, energy efficiency would be huge, um, a huge way to, to slow down the demand for energy and um, come up with other solutions so that we're not uh, destroying our, our natural environment. I know that you've been out talking to people about this issue and as you campaign. Do you get the sense that the people who are opposed understand the issue and in the, in the, the, what's really probably complex with the mm. moratorium or is the opposition mostly emotional? I think we're a very educated population, and um, they've studied the issues. They've gone to the uh, the forums, and um, and they truly believe that it is not needed. Um, even if they felt it was needed for uh, natural gas, they do not want to sacrifice their environment for it, and and the future, um, the health of the of their kids, their families, um, and just the the property values. Having a big thing like that run through. The other issue is that people don't think that um, studies have said that there's, there's not enough gas yeah. to come through that pipeline. So uh, it may last 10, 15 years, but after that, um, it diminishes. They think it might be at peak or, or nearing peak. So 
Um, once that avenue is there, they can push anything they want through it once they take it by eminent domain. So Carolyn Ness was one of the people that really made me think about that, and I give her credit because you know, I, I looked at this issue as a reporter from every angle I mm. thought, and one of the things she said to me was that frack gas is a finite gas, that, there's, that there isn't enough in there for it to be sustainable over a 25 or 30 year period. So it's possible you could tear up this beautiful countryside, build this pipeline, and in five or 10 years when the gas runs out, it becomes obsolete. And I think that that's an important point that isn't brought out often. True, yeah, absolutely. I, I just don't think um, enough people, um, well, uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, talk for the pipeline. Like um, we were talking earlier, there's not a real face out there, uh, proponents of the issue. And I see a lot of people against 90% uh, of the town that I know of, uh, that I've talked to when I go door to door, have, have said this is a major issue for them and their children. Well, the you future. see build a pipeline signs, they're sporadic. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some people that have been going to, to rallies and standouts but none of them want to stand up and be counted. And I'm not sure if that's because by design or because they feel like if they do stand up and be counted, they're going to become targets yeah. for whatever kind of, of uh, protests. Right. That may be it. I don't know. But. I, do, I do believe that there, you know, that there, uh, there is honest people that really believe that they need that infrastructure, the jobs for the future. Um, I just think we can take their energy and focus it in a different direction. Uh, we can use solar, I mean, there's a lot of solar fields going in. I, I cover a lot of Western Mass and, and I see them going in all over. And I think there's other ways that we can put our energy and money forward. Um, the town's taken a very hard line against this to the point where they've, they've pretty much banned Kinder Morgan from town, essentially. Yes. If you were on the board, when that debate was happening, would you have voted to go that way? I probably would have. I would have. I think we would have done everything we could to stop that because the majority of our constituents don't want it. So I think it's a health issue. Uh, there was a talk about the compressor station being sited here, On and there's Woman Hill of all places. Yes, and there's there's still talk of once they get it together, you still need different uh, mechanisms to push that stuff through the pipeline and. When they off-gas that stuff, that stuff settles right over our kids playing soccer out in the field. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy they did everything they could to stop it. Let's shift gears and talk a little bit about the budget. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you're familiar with the elementary school budget and sure. the committee, and you know um, that there's always a pull between what the town can afford and what the schools need, and there never seems to be enough money no. to go around. Um, but as a selectman, you know, you can't just be thinking about one department. You Correct. have to think about the entire town. So what do you think, what do you view as the budget priorities moving forward over the next year? So I think um, we, need to, we need to start focusing on some of the bigger infrastructure, the sewer, um, Headworks project. I'm starting, I've been going to the planning board meetings, the, um, the finance committee meetings, and listening to some of the issues that are coming out, the select board meetings. and. Sewer is a big issue. Uh, we have a, an infrastructure built in the 70s when I was born. Uh, Orange has the same thing and it's failing. Our guys are out there doing God knows what to keep it running and uh, you can't even get parts for this thing anymore. So I think putting money away and getting a study going to, to get this thing moving, uh, not just study, but actually get stuff moving and built in the town. I think people will feel better about paying taxes if they see production going on. Um, the school is a big, it's a huge part of our budget in every town. And even with all that money coming in, the study from the, um, that was just completed, the foundation budget committee uh, that the Senate just took up, um, well, a lot of people had just worked on, uh, found that we're underfunding our educa public education by um, $500 million a year. That's a huge chunk of money. Uh, charter schools also take a huge amount of money, school choice. A lot of these issues um, are, are really taking a, a big toll on our education and our money for our kids. And I think um, the Senate passed a bill last week. It's now over to the House. I, you know, it looks like it's coming down to a ballot initiative this it fall will. It will. Um, because the House isn't going to go for it. And Baker certainly is, I don't think, is going to sign it. So, um, but it went a long ways to address some of the issues. I don't fault any families to, to want to do the best for their kids and send them where they, they want to go and can get the best education. I think a lot of people don't realize what it does to the, to the kids left there. It's creating two different levels of education and they're public and they don't have to come and ask for money from the town and there's no oversight. Yeah. So uh, the bill may, went a long ways to address those issues. 
I just don't think it's enough. Um, well, maybe too little, too late. I mean, it's correct. It's, there's a, it's a very intricate bill. I've it tried is. to figure out. There's all kinds of little wrinkles in there. And one of the things I think that is positive about that Senate bill, and one of the reasons probably it won't pass, is that it gives regular ed districts a certain amount of oversight. And yes. You get to have one of your people on correct the charter school committee. It sort of forces the charter schools to share information on techniques and, and, and teaching. So, I mean, it's idealistic to the point of probably not being realistic. It was how they were supposed to be yeah. to begin with. They were supposed to bring this stuff back to the committees. And they, they say, well, no one calls us, but that's really not. Well, as not you know, the <laughs> government's planning and the execution, sometimes there's a big gap there. There is. And I think Senator Rosenberg's trying to fill that gap, but yes. I don't think it's going to be enough to be able to blunt what could be a, a really a devastating ballot question if it passes. You're talking about unregulated lifting of charter caps. You were ending public education where it began. Um, you know, this the, Massachusetts was the first place in the country and in the world that, that, that provided for free public education for all our children. And to have it uh, dismantled and not have a say of where that money's going and not have uh, any oversight, um, taxation without representation, really. So. Well, the, the good news is that the legislature has a, a historic record of not implementing ballot questions they don't like. Correct. <laughs> clean elections is a perfect example. Yes. Clean elections have yes. passed, and you know, they, they rolled back the income tax, but begrudgingly. Yes. So if, if there's a saving grace, maybe it's that they won't enact it if it passes. Yeah. But that's still unfortunate. Yeah. Anyway, so let's continue with the budget priorities. We talked a little bit before about what appears to be a lack of a cohesive five-year plan for some mm -hmm. of this stuff. Yes. Now, a five-year plan, a capital plan, is a wish list, but you're saying you like to see be more than a wish list, right? I do. I think we need to start you know, taking action on this stuff, and I think we could get action on it if we had more of a buy-in from the community, more people come to the meetings, more people um, get involved and have their voice heard. Um, I think from what I've talked to in the past going around chatting with people about running. I hear that we have a study, it, it gets, it gets uh, completed, and then kind of gets on a shelf, either lack of funding or lack of initiative in town. And we really need to do something with that because that really demoralizes the people who've spent all those hours honestly putting a plan together and then not have it acted on. It's just, you know, nobody wants to get involved after that. So I think if we, if we can get the buy-in and get people working together, um, we can get a lot accomplished. One of the concerns Selectman Gilmore expressed when he was here was the idea that the town is basically doing too much balancing of its budget on the back of what's called certified free cash, which is the money left over at the end yes. of the year after the, after the town pays its bills. How do you change that? How do you change that mindset and, and go and stop trying like raiding the piggy bank every year? Right. Well, that seems to be what happens is, uh, you know, we, we fund a department or something uh, at the end of the year. It's not all used. It happens to fall into free cash or permits or all this kind of stuff. And there's this this pot of money that just kind of gets recertified and then we buy tractors or I, again i'm not an i'm not an expert at it be I careful think, i think you're we, gonna have kevin scarborough ask i think you he talk. deserves his stuff i do believe but i think it needs to happen in a plan and i think he'd be the first to say it. he's one of the ones that are putting out these yeah. these 5 10 15 year plans um look we're going to need this in 10 years we're going to need this in five years and let's start putting money away for it now i think people would feel better about their taxes if they knew that this stuff was going to get accomplished and it had a plan. Um, if, you know, like the school roof, it came really quick. We knew about it. It came really quick for 20 years. So, um, right. Well, the truth of the matter is that that roof was never right. When they built correct. the school, it was never right. And yeah, from what I understand. I remember when that school got built and the roof was a problem from day one. Yes. From the day the punch list got finished, it was a problem. So, yes. But you're right, it took 20, 20 years to fix it. Yes. Now, theoretically, it's fixed. Hopefully, it is. Well, I hope, I hope with this, I mean, I think they've got what they have in plan to do it. It's still, you know, we'll see that it's going to take all summer to get it done and right. we hope everything goes well. Um, we have a good plan together from what I understand the group that kind of led that, led that initiative. But I know a lot of people in town felt like we could have done it for less if we had planned forward and maybe did the funding on our own. I'm not so sure of sure. that, but I, but I do know, um, 
if people knew it was coming a little sooner, we, I know we put a little bit away. It's hard because we don't have a lot of money to exactly. put away. But if we can make plans and say, look, town, this is what we're doing, and we want to put this money away for, because the sewer needs to be fixed, um, we need to start on that. It's tough also when you have a town like this that is so dependent on the residential property owners for the lion's share of the tax base. And one of the, the challenges any town leader faces in a, t in a town like this is how do you keep the town bucolic and green and, and preserve the open spaces and still be able to encourage growth to take some of the heat off the taxpayers. Yeah. What do you think about that? Is there a way to do that? I think there is. I think marketing our town for what we have to offer our whole valley. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful places to live in the country. Um, it's got, you know, we're surrounded by five colleges, education, diversity. I think if we, if we um, market our location to not only just the state, but around the country of places to bring, it, uh, bring businesses in, I mean, what a wonderful place to live, hike, uh, raise your kids, wonderful school systems. Uh, I can't think of a better place to live. I mean, it's nice to travel, but it's always great to come home. Deerfield is a beautiful place. And I think if you can, uh, if you can uh, bring infrastructure in uh, with the sewer, find out what these issues are, don't fully know exactly everything that would need to, do, need to be done to bring business in. But if we can bring uh, business in, um, promote the town for the benefits we have. I can't think of a better place to set up business. I mean, look at Yankee Candle for all those years exactly. and what that's done for our town um, and, and the whole valley. I mean, it really, um, we need to start thinking broader at, at, at this and we are, um, we're a wonderful place to live and we could, we could promote it as such and get some, get some tax relief. It's also unique because there's two towns in one. You've got Old Deerfield and you've got South Deerfield. Very different villages, you know, Old Deerfield, of course, Old Money, you've got mm -hmm. the various historic organizations, you have Deerfield Academy, and then you got right. down here in South Deerfield. But the center of South Deerfield is really the town's hub, I think. Absolutely. What do you think should be done, or should something be done, with the center of town to make it more appealing both to business and to people coming down here? Yeah, absolutely. I know we've talked about fixing the sidewalks and all, and that's kind of a, a, kind of a facelift thing, but I, I think it, it's important when people come to a town they love the idyllic charm of that. I mean, if you go to some of these towns, if you're on vacation, it's the downtown, it's the sidewalks, it's the shops, it's the, it's the um, you know, not so much nightlife, but just the feel of the town as people are walking around. You don't want it run down. You want it to look good, inviting, places to play, parks to play in. I think that's important. And yes, that all costs money, but in the end, um, if it drives people to move here, for our education, for our parks, for our, um, you know, for, for the way the town looks and feels and, and uh, the community of it, I think it's, it pays in the end. John Prosperi, who you are very much linked politically with in a way, you guys are of like minds. One of the things he said he wants to see done if he's elected is an immediate attention paid to the town common, to, mm -hmm. to spruce it up, to make it better. Um, is that something you would support? I would. I think, um, again, it's a focal point. It's um, I, I've driven by for years thinking, you know, this could be such a beautiful place. Um, it is a gorgeous place already, but it's, it's a drive-by right now. I think if we, you know, it's nice to have summer concerts there. Uh, there have been studies since, uh, I think there was a study done maybe a year, year and a half ago about getting it safe to get off the PVTA bus and get across the street to one of the stores. It's, it's, um, you're taking your life in your hands. So if we can, if we can upgrade that. One of the issues that's been somewhat divisive over the last year has been South County EMS. Should sure. it stay in Deerfield? Should it go to Whaley? Uh, clearly, it's, the situation now has been five different locations. It's, it's not optimal. Uh, there are some people in Deerfield that feel very strongly that SCEM should stay here. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I, I am, uh, I'm open-minded for it. I, I think they do a wonderful job. Um, everybody agrees that um, they have... They have uh, to have paramedic service. I, I needed that a couple years ago and I had to wait for a second ambulance and pay for two ambulances. So to have, to have one show up with all the equipment and, and needed to help you, um, it's very important. So they do a great job. I think we can find a solution to where it's sited. I think there's an RFP out right now to, f to find a centrally located area. I would love to have it stay in Deerfield. I would love to have it right on 116 and either, you know, five and 10 next to the, the Deerfield Firehouse now, but even a more centrally located for our friends in Waitley and Sunderland would be right, right near the town um, state garage. If we had, I don't know what there's land for, but 
um, next to the water district, that would be a great location, but that would cost money. I mean, you're gonna have to put up a whole new building. Waitley, I think, has a building that is open right now, but I, you know, again, is it, it's not really optimal, optimal because it's, it takes a while to get out onto the main roads from there, and I think people are validly concerned about response times, but we have to, now that it's a group thing, our town's decided to come together, we have to think of it as a community as well. It's not just one town. You're running for the one year remaining term for Selectman Wolfram who is leaving and there's going to be a learning curve. I mean, Absolutely. You're, you're going to, I mean, in one year, you probably by the end of the first that year, you're probably going to just know the job. That's it. So, but I, I, I do want to ask this question because I've asked it of other candidates. Do you have any goals, specific goals for that first year if you get elected? What would you want to work on first? I think um, to have the respect of the board back. Um, not to say that they aren't respected now, but that's kind of grumblings you hear in town of, I, really? think, I think with anywhere, um, you know, politicians don't get the best rap. Um, I think bringing some stability to the, to the town, bringing some, um, some vision to the board that would uh, have people cohesively work together to move our agenda along would go a long ways. I think make more pe listening to the people and uh, getting more people involved in town government um, I think would be a huge step. Like you said, it's going to take me a year to get involved. I thought this would be a great first step for me if the town would have me to uh, learn, the, learn the position and then uh, run again in a year for a three-year term with goals and plans for moving forward. It is going to take a while. I've been going to a lot of the planning board <coughs> meetings, the select board meetings, the finance committee, which I think is run very well under uh, Dylan Corpita right now. They do a great job looking at the looking at the issues and, and the budget. Um, they care a lot about the town and the finances. Um, and I'm learning a lot about that whole process. But to promise a lot of stuff right off the bat, it would be disingenuous to say we're going to complete all this stuff in my first year. I and think. no matter what you do, you're going to upset somebody. Of the, course. The, the, the toughest part about this job, in my experience, watching select boards over the course of 25 years, is to a person, they'll tell you that the thing that's most disappointing is you can't please everybody. Correct. And you know, this no bigger board. This is the top policy board in the town. So right. you're, you're going to aggravate someone. I and, hope in, not. <laughs> and in Deerfield, aggravating people tends to not only come with the job, but it's almost intensified because people down here are very strong in their opinions. They're passionate. They are. And they should be. And we have people that have been involved in, in town uh, for a very long time and kind of feel how the way it should be run. and. Um, they have a lot of respect for, for the town and they want it to run smoothly and be, um, be respected and have, have pride in their town. And I hope to give that to them. It's going to take a while and I know I won't please everybody. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I will try my hardest is to listen to their issues. Um, and I, I'm not coming at this with a, um, with an agenda. Maybe next year I'll have an agenda because I'll know a lot of the issues. I mean, I do have some ideas on what I'd like to do, but but it's going to take a year to really study them and understand them and come at it with a, with a real solid plan. But I think I can bring people together, um, move meetings along quicker, understand the issues and work a little smoother to, to do the town of the business, you know, business of the town. Before I let you make your final pitch, which I do for every candidate at the end of the meeting, um, seniors are a huge demographic in this town. And I know that there's a senior center right now that is in need of some upgrading. Mm -hmm. uh, that building, though, is solid, and there's talk about renovating it. What do you think can be done for the seniors over the next year? Uh, I think we really need to take an active role in taking care of our seniors. Uh, a lot of times, a majority of the budget goes to education, right? Rightly so. Our seniors sometimes get left out of that equation. Um, you know, we'll all be there someday, and I think um, th they've played such an active role in our town in raising us and. Uh, and providing for us, we need to provide for them. We need to look at, you know, we've talked a lot about senior housing. That building itself, right, the bones are good. I, need, I would love to do a study inside to see what it looks for myself. I know there are some issues, uh, some warrants on the town um, from the Capital Planning Board that want to see some things done, and I think that's, that's a first step for sure. But um, I would like to, in the future, maybe on a five-year plan, have a community building, whether it's that one or another with a de declining remote enrollment of our kids um, in, in, in the whole area. Maybe we get a community center together where we have FCAT join, we have seniors, great. we have 
Um, we have uh, pre-K education, everybody coming together um, as a community, seems like as we used to do, um, get everybody under one roof and, and start addressing the needs of the town and becoming more, uh, more cohesive, for sure. All right, Trevor McDaniel, what I want you to do now as we end this interview is look into that camera right there. Okay. And directly speak to the voters and tell them why you should be the next selectman. Well, I thank you very much for the opportunity to run. Um, I've been a part of the community for uh, over a decade. Uh, I love this town. I love the people. I, um, I think I could do a good job of listening to your concerns and relaying them uh, through town policy. Um, I, I enjoyed you know, raising my family here. I've met so many nice people over the last 12 years, uh, especially since you have a child, you get involved with a lot more of the community things. Um, so I would just love your vote. I would love to have your support as we um, try to move forward with the town. So thank you very much. Election day in Deerfield is May 2nd. My guest has been Trevor McDaniel, candidate for the one year unexpired term seat being vacated by Selectman Wolfram. And he's running against Leonard Gripko Jr. Once again, no matter how you feel about these candidates, make sure you get out and vote on May 2nd. That'll do it for South County Spotlight. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.